And then I hear, Nathan, is Nathan in there? Where's Nathan? And it's fucking Anthony Hopkins. He's like, Nathan Wiley, where is he? And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is happening. <laughs> I gotta tell Anthony Hopkins that he looked up the wrong Nathan Wiley. <laughs> And I won't name names, but one of us, wasn't me, <laughs> said, oh, we're filming Halo. Yeah. And we play Spartans. And one of them, I'll never forget, one of them was like, yeah, so is this season going to be better than the first season? It's really, really hard, I think, to make fans happy. Like, he was yoked for the show. And we trained once or twice together, and he was just on another level. This was kind of the first time I witnessed how invested he was in in the production as a whole how much he cared yeah because he cared a lot for me it was funny with matt smith because i'd never seen doctor who yeah. <laughs> so we're going everywhere and everyone's like oh matt da, 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 da. and i'm like why is this guy famous how, how is working with him he's amazing he's a class act you know 100 people on set 20 people like in my mm -hmm. face makeup whatever you know and i picked up this napkin and put it in my lap and the whole crew was like Damn it. And I was like, what happened? I had no idea what I'd done wrong. So we did Downton 3. And that's a huge world. Yeah. A lot of expectation, a lot of people. Everyone already knows each other. You may not always want to do what you think is written on the page yeah. necessarily, the way it's written, how it's written, because a lot of people are going to do that. How you do. And you put out a breakdown for 20, 20 characters, and you put it out on Spotlight, and then you see all the agencies that submit actors. You're like, damn. Hi, I'm Jerry Gozin, and this is Beyond Real Talk, a podcast where I invite real entertainment industry professionals and ask them real questions. What are they actually doing? How are they doing it? Why are they doing it? And how can you start doing the same thing? And my today's guest is a London-born but LA-raised voice, theater, film, uh, and TV actor. You might have seen him in Halo series, The Program, Absentia, Red 2, Berlin Station, Burton Dickey, the Justice League, and of course, most importantly, the good neighbor where we actually met. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in your showreel. <laughs> yes, you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was a great scene. That was a great scene. And you might uh, have heard his voice in multiple video games, radio, plays, and on TV. Nathan Wiley. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank hey, you. Thank Thanks you for being here. So you were born in London. And then you moved to LA when you were two years old. Yeah. And then you studied in New York, in London, and now you live here. Yeah. Do you, do you think you're American or British more? I, yeah, I don't look at it like that, I guess. I, I think I'm both, you know, obviously I have a, an American accent, but um, I love so many aspects about California um, and, uh, and the US, but I also, I love so many aspects about England. And mm -hmm. I moved here 12 years ago, just about, and uh, and I've loved it ever since. So I've never, <laughs> yeah, I've never wanted to leave. I've never felt, like, oh crap, America's better, or, yeah, or something like that. No, it's just you know I consider myself a citizen of both places. Yeah, which technically I am. So, is it the culture shock every time when you move from one place to another? Because there there should be like a difference, cultural difference between huge, America and Britain. huge. Yeah, I'd say the biggest culture shock is. Uh, is the lack of commercialism and kind of capitalism that's here in England. Mm -hmm. And then when you go back to the States, you're suddenly smacked in the face with, you know, buy this insurance, buy these, you know, mm -hmm. pharmaceuticals and, and it's everywhere, constant. It's like a, you know, a bombardment of, of stuff they're trying to sell you. Yeah, no, it's, so that's, I think that's the biggest culture shock. I, and whenever I come back to England, I kind of feel like, oh, I can, you know, the anxiety dissipates a little bit. I don't feel like I'm being sold something, you know, and uh, it kind of feels more relaxing. Mm. But at the same time, you know, when you're busy and you go to the States and if you're going for work or something like that, you relish that sense of, you know, frenzy, that like hunger to to work, to find to find a, you know, to do your best, to be the best, you know, and, and it, you know, payments and, and uh, Paychecks and stuff are typically bigger there because the, yeah. pool, the pool is bigger. You know, there's, there's there's a lot more actors to choose from. So if you happen to get a job there, typically the money's better. They have better unions and all that. So acting, <laughs> why? Why? Oh God, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, it's it's. I had so my both my parents were 
in the entertainment industry. Uh, my father isn't anymore and my mother still is. And I kind of grew up with it. I grew up hearing the lingo, hearing mm. these conversations all the time. Um, what did your parents do? So my father's now uh, a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So he works for, for the California um, District Attorney's Office. Mm -hmm. And my, my mother is a casting director mm. and has been for 40 years plus, 40 plus years. Yeah. So um, you always have someone good, like, you know, to, to give you good advice. She's been amazing. She's always given me the best advice and, and stuff like that. But you always have to kind of imagine, you know, a scenario where she's not there. Yeah. And how would you behave without her advice? Because sometimes, you know, you don't, you don't want the advice and you want to just trust your instincts and do mm -hmm. make a decision based off what you think is best for you. And of course, you know, she's my mother. So, you know, there's always her maternal instincts are playing, you know, what's best for me as a person, not necessarily. Yeah. But I mean, her, her, you know, her motivations are always great. So there's never, you know, anything amiss. Yeah. So you were in this kind of like for, from your childhood, that's why you decided to. I, I have three brothers and a sister and my three brothers were, were all athletic and we all played sports and we were always competing with each other and, fighting and all that great stuff mm -hmm. and sh acting for me kind of became the thing that was unique to me you mm -hmm. know my older brother was really good at baseball really good semi-pro um the brother beneath me also very good played like high level of baseball and then my youngest brother is like a world-class surfer mm -hmm. so and then my sister is just an incredible singer and she she dabbles a bit in the acting world as well but for me it was my niche and uh, be, not being like amazing in sports, not bad, mm -hmm. but not being amazing. The first time I started, I did improv in high school. Um, and that was just so fun because I was always a wise ass. I was always getting in trouble with teachers and improv became like this channel, mm -hmm. this conduit for me to kind of express my sarcasm <laughs> or whatever and, and have, have just a method to, to, thrive in a way that was different you yeah. know because i think siblings all do that they all try and be I think different so, from yeah, each other in a way they had my school i was really lucky at a school with a great kind of theater they had a, a student theater and and um i went to loyola high school yeah and the director there uh i met he came to one of the matches the improv matches and he was like hey we have a play mm -hmm. do you want to audition so i auditioned for the play i got in the play um it, How was, old were you? it was Romeo and Juliet. <sighs> um, I was, I guess, 15 yeah. at the time, 15 or 16 at the time. Uh, and I got in the play and I went to an all boys school. And at the play, we had girls. We had <laughs> girls from the sister schools who were in the play. And I was like, well, girls, I'm seeing <laughs> girls now during the week, which was, you know, unusual. So I was like, all right, cool. I'm doing this. Oh, and we change in the same changing room? I'm definitely doing this, <laughs> you know? So yeah, for me, I, I loved it. And I loved, I loved being on stage and getting laughs and, you know, and, and getting an emotional response to performance. Mm -hmm. So that's how it all started. So yeah, so I started doing plays in high school and then I ended up auditioning for, in the States, you audition, and you do in the UK as well, but we auditioned, you know, me and my other actor friends auditioned for like, 10 schools, 20 schools, oh, really go around, they come to, you know, LA, they host auditions in like hotels and stuff. And you go in these like convention centers and you do a couple monologues and you get, you get into a school yeah. or you don't. Yeah. Um, and they're pretty ruthless. Um, so I almost went to UCLA, uh, and I, a girl, <laughs> a girl broke up with me, mm. a local LA girl. And, uh, and I was really upset about that. And I was like, I just have to get out of California. And uh, with some coaching and some advice from a few people, I ended up going to school in mm. New York. So I studied at Fordham, which was great. Yeah. Great school. Um, big kind of East Coast American Jesuit school. Um, yeah. So that, and so I studied acting there for four years. And then uh, in the midst of that, that's, I had, they had a study abroad yeah uh option it was like a, like one semester or, or yeah 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 it was one semester and it was at uh lambda and um i think they were affiliated like the schools were affiliated mm. so 
for me, there was a couple other kids in my group uh, at Fordham who wanted to go as well. So the, I think it was three or four of us. We went. Yeah. Um, and I've always, you know, had an affinity for England and I've always loved it. And so when I went, it ended up being my favorite time yeah. in, in college. Um, just learning the classical English approach to, mm. to acting and to training, you know, singing and voice and stage combat. Well, what was the difference between English and, for example, American? I'd say like in the American way, you know, they have all these, you know, teachers that, you know, it's not necessarily one method or another. And they kind of threw us into exploring all the methods. So, you know, Meisner and, and whatever else. Um, and in England, they didn't really do that. In England, they tended to focus more on the technique uh, of approaching the text and working with the text and being, I would say, more truthful. Mm -hmm. Not that you're, you know, being dishonest in your American acting or anything like that. You know, definitely not. But I, I appreciated the more classical approach of just analyzing the text. You know, we did a lot of Shakespeare. We did a lot of uh, mm -hmm. restoration plays. And so just kind of getting under the character's, you know, skin in that sense. I, I really like that. And I, and I liked the, I liked the stage combat. I liked, you know, playing with a sword or, or, yeah. you know, a, a shield and, and, and a, or an ax or whatever. I enjoyed all that. I found it much more like viscerally, you know, rewarding. Yeah. But interestingly enough, it's so funny because I still use today and I used throughout college, um, the approach to a character that my high school teacher mm -hmm. gave me. And I yeah. still use it now. Great guy called Walter Wolf. Yeah. And he had this amazing outline of structuring and, and scoring your script. And I still use it now. And I use how, it all throughout how, how does it look? Well, I mean, at, at a rough look, it's, it's basically seven beats. And that's seven beats that go into the overall arc of the play or mm -hmm. film script. Um, and those seven beats can also be found in a scene, mm. even in a monologue within a scene. Seven beats are exposition. Mm -hmm. What's going on? Yeah. You know, where are you? You know, what's the, the backstory? Um, the point of attack. So the moment your character decides what they're going to do to, mm -hmm. you know, face their conflict or their objective. Um, and then the complication, challenge and crisis are the three attempts, you know, fail or succeed that your character yeah. will make um, to accomplish their objective. And then your climax, the sort of it all coming to a head and then the resolution, how it's resolved. Mm hmm. You know what I mean? How much does it change for, for, for example, so you like you have this kind of approach. You're in a scene with your scene partner. Yeah. And you can't pre-plan what they will do. No. Yeah. So you still have to be very flexible at how to react. Definitely. Yeah. It's especially in film. Yeah. You know, uh, but in, you know, in theater, you get that chance. You know, you're, you're guaranteed, hopefully, that chance to rehearse. Of course. No, no, no. You um, rehearse, but still, like every, every time it's a little bit different. Every time you still kind of, you don't want to kind of stay you know, exactly the same thing that you did like last performance. Yeah. So you still kind of should be a bit flexible to, to see what your partner does and to react, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think so in theater, I think you're blessed with rehearsal more often, definitely than, than in film. But I think on, on stage, it does change, you know, to a degree every night, your performance, something happens and it's live. So anything could happen. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think your overall core, you know, trajectory of the scene or the whole play more or less stays the same. Yeah. Unless the director comes in and says that's not really working or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, which doesn't normally happen mid run or something. But yeah, with film, like when I go into a, a, a shoot and I've got all this stuff structured out in my head, that's there mainly for me. Mm -hmm. That's that's there mainly for um, my my prep you know, my research, whatever. And then, yeah, you could go into the scene and the actor could just throw you a total curveball. Mm -hmm. And you're like, wow, I really didn't anticipate them saying it that way or whatever, or them doing that. And so, yeah, you got to be present. You got to be in the moment. Um, yeah. So I think with film and TV, it kind of does, it does, it helps you, but you have to let it go yeah. to, you know, to a certain extent and be prepared for anything when you walk yeah. in there or the director. Cause you know, you don't often run your scene scoring by the director mm. and the director may go, that's, that's terrible. Yeah. Or that's like, <laughs> that's, 
That was good. Yeah. But let's yeah, let's, let's not do that. Else. Yeah. You know? I don't think he would throw up there. So don't yeah. throw up there. <laughs> so when you finished the school, yeah. you stayed in New York. I stayed in New York for two years. Yeah. Uh, I was lucky enough to get a couple really uh, decent agents, commercial and and uh, and theater and TV and stuff. And uh, I found it pretty tough. I found, I found New York really... Um, merciless in a way yeah um not just with regards to like you know working in on stage or, or doing or doing films or whatever but there was it's non-stop i worked so when i finished school i worked as a stage technician yeah as a carpenter and i did that i mean up until about four years ago everywhere i did it here in london did it in new york broadway but living in new york dude <laughs> You, you, you know, you're lucky if you get a, an acting job, which I did a few off off Broadway plays and, and stuff like that. And, and a couple. Can you explain what is off off Broadway? So, yeah, it's a fringe, basically. So it's like self-produced work. Mm -hmm. So off off Broadway. So you have off Broadway. So that would be like, for instance, here would be like the Royal Court or the Hampstead mm -hmm. or something like that. It's not in the West End, but it's a professional theater. Very well recognized. Top grade actors work there. Right. Yeah and directors and everything and then broadway would be like west end so broadway would be you know all the big shows like yeah. whatever hello dolly or i would do off off broadway so like pub theater mm -hmm. teensy little theaters there's, there's a couple really great ones in new york so i did a bunch of those and but you got maybe 40 people in the audience you know um and then i did like a couple professional tv jobs in new york uh which were great great stories but uh but then I, when I was here at Lambda, which was in my third year of school, I met an agent who came to one of the shows at Lambda mm. and he expressed interest in representing me. It was great that I had a British passport and I loved England, I had come so many times. My mother's English, so I'd come with family trips and stuff. I loved England. And he was like, you know, come and I'll represent you. And I said no at the time because I wanted to finish school. Yeah. So finish school in New York. And he kept in touch, which was really cool. And one day he sent me an audition for Bert and Dickie. Yeah. And he said, can you tape for this? And it just so happened that I was actually in London with my family visiting. He didn't know. I hadn't told him I was coming. And I was like, I'm actually here. And he was like, oh, amazing. Go in for the meeting. And I had 12 hours notice. The meeting was at like 10 a.m. This was at 6 p.m. Mm. You know, I had no time. So I, I wasn't even off book. So it was it was a big scene. It was a pretty big scene, you know. It was it was maybe you know three four pages, and yeah. you know at the time I think about that Nate and this Nate. If you gave me three or four pages now, I, I'd have it ready for you in thirty minutes, you know. But at that time, I needed all the time I could process, you know, the world. And so I went in. I was shitting myself, you know, like this is I'm going to screw this up. And I went in, and the casting director. Uh, was Amy Hubbard and uh, and I think at the time her, her father was also casting with her and um, and together they were so nurturing yeah and we worked through the scene and I think they just liked my energy they, they liked what I brought they liked that I was naturally American and this was a you know an American character and I booked it yeah which was you know mind-blowing for me you know BBC huge you know mm. and I was like great so I ended up then staying. That was supposed to be a week trip or two weeks. And I ended up staying for, I think it was 14 weeks. Stayed on my mom's friend's couch, mm. <laughs> walking her dog as payment <laughs> every day um, and filmed. And that was amazing. Why, why did he want to, go to come to England? So this, mm. when I booked that, Jeremy Conway at the time was like, my agent was like, oh, look, I'm going to represent you. And he started sending me auditions. Yeah. So now I'm living in New York and I'm auditioning all the time for projects that are filming either in LA or in London. Mm. Nothing's going on in New York except these, you know, off off Broadway productions that I'm killing myself to produce, direct, write, whatever, be in. Mm. It's killing me. I'm not going to be on Broadway until I'm 45 at this rate, you know, so mm. I want to do something. And I kept getting these auditions and then I had to fly out here a couple of times for recalls and stuff like that. And so I just, you know, I looked at my wife and was like, Let's, let's just move to England. So we moved here. Uh, that was summer of 2012. 
the Olympics were going on. It was nuts. All the roads were crazy. And, uh, and we moved here and then the, that film came out and I got a lot of momentum off of that. It was a TV movie and I got a lot of momentum. People were stoked about it. It was an Olympic themed movie to coincide with the Olympics. Matt Smith, it was, it was amazing. Yeah. That came out and then I was like, all right, let's stay here for a couple of years, see, see what happens. Mm -hmm. And she, she could work as well, so we were set. So we had a small, uh, small apartment and we just started living here. And then, was Matt Smith already a doctor or was he was, right he was Doctor Who at the he time? He was already, yeah. yeah. So it was like he was already like a big name. Yeah. For me, it was funny with Matt Smith because I'd never seen Doctor Who. <laughs> so we're going everywhere and everyone's like, oh, Matt. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, why is this guy famous? How, how was working with him? Dude, amazing, man. Yeah. He's amazing. He's a class act. Like, I would relish an opportunity to work with him again because he's a total pro. Like, he embodies all of that preparation, all of that forethought and, and kind of intellectual approach to a role that yeah. I love. He embodies all that and he's just so much fun. He's just so... Are you still in contact? We, I, yeah, I saw him after the first season of The Crown came out. So a few years ago, I saw him. Um, I was working at the Old Vic Theater mm -hmm. as a carpenter mm -hmm. and uh, I had just come in for the day um, and uh, I was doing something and they were like, you know, this is a Matt Smith play with Claire Foy. I forget the name of it. And uh, I was like, oh, really? Is Matt, is Matt here? Mm. And he walks out on stage like mm. while I'm having this conversation. So we said hello and had yeah. a chat and stuff. But we're not friends or anything like that. But he's, he's so incredibly nice, like mm. such a nice dude. And so we had a chat for like 10, 15 minutes, caught up a bit. And yeah, I think that was like five, six years ago. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Quite a while. Pre-COVID. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Don't yeah. remind me. It was another life. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally another life. <laughs> All right. And? And that was it. The rest is, you know, history. I just stayed, basically. Yeah. What, what, what do you prefer? Uh, film or screen or theater? At, at this moment, I would say, you know, the, the treasure is to do a play, a good play. You know, there's nothing like it. You know, I, I actually saw... Hello Dolly last night, <laughs> which is, it was glorious. You know, Imelda Staunton, terrifically directed, wonderful cast. And she came out on stage uh, to do the Hello Dolly number and the audience wouldn't let her sing. They were so loud. She said the first line and the audience basically stood up clapping. Whoa. You know, after the first like bit of the song, she waited till they died down and then she started singing again. Like it was so moving, like it was electric. And she just, you know, she got through the song and, you know, after the audience shut up and they, she didn't finish the song by like the final verse or whatever, right before the big crescendo, they stood up again and started clapping <laughs> and just like, she was just, you could tell. Yeah. She was so moved, so emotional by it. And that, that's irreplaceable that kind of feeling. Now, I've never had that happen to me, mm. but when you feel that energy in the room in theater, you're like, this is, this is why we do this, you know? Yeah. Um, but I think with, you know, with film and TV, obviously you're, you're, you're more stable with, with a paycheck being bigger because theater doesn't pay that well, but you have, you know, a greater sense, I think in a way, a, a sense of accomplishment, like, you know, you're, you're on the international stage so to speak, when you do film or TV, yeah. mm. especially now with streaming and, yeah. and all that stuff, you know. How did you get into Halo? It was a normal self tape. And the one note on the casting brief was picture the scene in Top Gun where mm. the pilots are all in the locker room and they're bickering and bantering yeah. and having, and for me, Top Gun was just like this wonderful reference they could have said, which they don't often do these references yeah. in the briefs and stuff when you when you get a tape. And for me, that that definitely lit a little spark because growing up, my dad and mom used to take us to Costco, which is like this huge grocery store, like a yeah. wholesaler. And uh, because there were so many of us and we were nuts and we weren't really allowed to watch TV during the week, uh, we could, we, we crushed movies at the weekends and stuff, but we weren't allowed, we weren't allowed to, and then we, so he would set us up at the TV monitors in Costco, my parents, my dad, or my mom, and they, he'd be like, stay here and watch TV 
I'm going to go do the shopping, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we'd be standing there and we'd be watching TV, but what they're selling the TV is obviously. So what they would have is like basically some, some, you know, clip on a loop yeah. <laughs> from a movie. And obviously Top Gun, this big like action movie with like, you know, a great opportunity to demonstrate speakers and all this other great stuff and the quality of the visual, you know, the TV. So I'll, I'll never forget watching like the same 10 minute segment of Top Gun on this big screen. <laughs> over and over. On this huge TV <laughs> that we would never afford. <laughs> we would watch it over and over again. And it's the jets like, whoo, you know, and we're like, it's so cool. And we're like, you know, 10, 11, 12 or whatever. And then we were finally old enough to see the movie and VHS in those days. Oh, yeah. When we could watch the movie when we were like 15, 16, we just watched a thousand times, you know, he's so cool on the motorcycle blah, blah, blah. and then, yeah, this character in Halo was, they said, they said specifically, imagine Val Kilmer mm. as Iceman. And so that, that really touched a nerve. So I immediately felt free doing the tape. And so we, my buddy, my buddy Parker came over and, and we did the tape and he's tremendously talented. And we did like two or three takes of the tape and on the fourth one, we just let it go and had some fun and it ended up being hilarious. Yeah. And we just sent that tape. Yeah. And it ended you, up- You just sent one or, or Just two? sent one. Just one. Yeah, yeah, just sent the one that was like the throwaway one, you know, like let's just have some fun and, and just goof around. And that was the one we sent. And, uh, and that was, yeah. And then I, I booked the job. I didn't have a recall or anything like that. They just said, come on in. Nice. Which was amazing. And mm -hmm. Halo itself was, this amazing production, you know, yeah. in, in filmed in Budapest and, you know, Paramount. Paramount are huge. And yeah, so yeah, they're doing some really good stuff now. Really, really good stuff. Yeah, though Halo was critiqued a lot by the fans of the games. I yes, think. Yeah, yeah, I did hear this. Yeah. <laughs> How do you feel about it? So we were there filming and uh, we went out to a bar one night and uh, me and I, so I played a Spartan. Um, and a couple of the other Spartans went out to a bar and we're there and we're, you know, we're not supposed to talk about what we're doing. And, uh, do other people to each other? <laughs> well, probably both, you know, we're not supposed to talk, especially say like, you know, any specifics about what we're doing, mm -hmm. but we're there and we ended up kind of sharing a standing table with another group, a group of guys who were like on a bachelor party or something. And they were great fun. And we we're, we we're talking to them and, but they were like, but you're American. Like, and he, you know, a couple of, our, you know, so there's a few of us standing around and they're like, oh, come on. What are you, so you're actors. What are you guys doing here? What are you doing here? And I won't name names, but one of us wasn't me <laughs> said, oh, we're filming Halo yeah. and we play Spartans, but I can't say any more than that. Hmm. And, uh, they blew up. Yeah. These guys were like, what? That's so fucking cool. You know? <laughs> To, what are you guys doing? Is it crazy? Are there aliens? Like, are you shooting aliens? Like all this stuff. So they're super Halo dudes. And, uh, and one of them, I'll never forget. One of them was like, yeah, so is this season going to be better than the first season? And I'd seen the first season and I liked the first I season. I enjoyed it. I, I actually really liked it and, and was like, um, I mean, it's, it's a new season, dude. Like it's going to be, it's going to be what it is. It's different, you know, yeah. but it's, it's going to be great. It's going to be fun, mm -hmm. you know, trying to not kill the vibe or whatever with this guy. What am I going to say? Like, oh, it's going to be, it's going to be terrible, bro. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I was like, no, no, it's, it's going to be fine. It's going to be great. And, uh, he goes, he goes, yeah, I just want some more action. Mm -hmm. He's like, we, we play these games and we want some more action. And I was like, well, don't worry, dude, you're, you're going to get action. Mm. You know? You're going to go action. But that, that's what I heard. I heard a lot of people were like vying for more action. I, mean, I haven't, I haven't watched the whole second season yet, the one I'm in. So, yeah. but I've seen the previews and the trailers and, and, and stuff like that of, of, you know, how it ends and all that. And there's a lot of action. Let us know in the comments, what you think about the series and the games. Are you fans? Are you not? Why? You better be fans. I watched, honestly, here's the thing. Like I never played the games. I never played like the Halo games, so I can't judge. But at the same time, as a separate for me, I enjoyed it. There were like some things that I was like wasn't really impressed. But in general, I really enjoy action. There is action. It's fucking great. Yeah, it's amazing. I think it's it's really good, and it looks amazing too. It's not yeah. just it's not just like it. It has every. It takes all the boxes. Yeah, and at the same time, like there is a story, and I just decided at some point that. It's really, really hard, I think, to make 
fans happy. So, yeah, you're never going mean, to make everybody like, happy. Fallout did it. Like Fallout was like basically, I think all Fallout fans are really, really happy with it. But it's it's a really rare case. Usually, when it's uh, it's a film or series that's based on a game. There will be someone who's who's unhappy. I remember they were like, "Well, Master Chief never takes off the helmet. This is like my." But yeah, but in a game when you run around and shoot aliens, but here you have an amazing actor who plays uh, Master Chief. Yeah, Pablo. And, yeah, yeah, and also it's just like Forrester. You can't have this guy all the time wearing a helmet and hide this good good actor. Like, and just in general, it's a story like that. Yeah, sometimes you are in the locker rooms. Naked, <laughs> or like in the shower the rest of the scenes, they were like, you know. But it's it's a series. It's a very different media than a game. You can't just make it all action, 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 because only Halo fans will be happy, and not all of them will as yeah. well. Yeah, so yeah. I, I, I was a bit confused. I think for me, it was I really enjoyed it. I kind of enjoyed it. I want more, but I'm not sure. Is it will be there a season three? I don't think there's gonna be a season yeah. three. I saw an article uh, a couple months ago saying I think the show has been yeah. has been stopped. But I don't know. You I never think... know. I mean, it's a huge universe, the Halo yeah. universe. You know, I, I did a, a giant deep dive and I totally nerded out. I didn't mm. play any of the games, but I read all the books and mm. and uh, listened to a couple audio books about it. And they have, you know, they have so much in that world that they can yeah. explore if they wanted to do something else. I've heard rumors they're gonna do a movie and stuff like yeah. that. So yeah, maybe I don't know. I I I. I think like sometimes fans are right. Sometimes there are some horrible productions that are based on books or film or like games or whatever. Yeah, I think in this case it was it was uh, it was a good good production. I enjoyed it. Yeah. How was it working on it? Working on it was great. I mean, it was <laughs> the the bet the one of the funniest things for me about it was they were like, "Look, Spartans are fucking strong yeah. and huge." So here's a gym membership, <laughs> and we're checking to make sure that you're going every oh, day. Really? And I love the gym. Yeah. Like I, I work out as much as I can. You know, like I'm like, sweet, I'm gonna kill this. I'm gonna get big. <laughs> so I'm going to the gym every day, two hours in the gym. You know, and I'm drinking protein shakes, and I'm and I'm talking. There's a personal trainer who's like, you know, supervising our workouts and stuff, like sending us things, and checking in with us all the time. And, I'm getting big. I'm getting really strong, and it's I'm I'm enjoying that. And they they then go after like you know we've been there for a couple of weeks, and we're working out as a team. Like mm -hmm. me and and two of the other you know actors were Spartans working out as a team, and and we're like, damn, like are we gonna have to be naked? Like what's we gonna be like wearing towels? <laughs> like what are they you know like in no. Top Gun? You know? So and we haven't we've had a couple of discussions with the costume department and and the makeup team and stuff and. Uh, and they've told us like we're going to cover you guys in like augmentation scars, which is how in this in the lore of Halo, they had the the Spartans were surgically augmented with you know hmm. killer instincts and like all this stuff and and so anyway so they're like surgically not by I don't think they're bionic but they were you know hormonally adjusted to be like superhuman. So we're like damn like scars is like. I think we're gonna be naked because <laughs> it takes place in the locker room. So yeah. we're killing ourselves in the gym, you know, dieting and, and the whole nine yards. We show up. I remember <laughs> I show up for my fitting uh, like a few days, whatever, before we're supposed to shoot, and they're very hush hush about everything, you know. So I have no idea what costume's gonna be, if any, you know, what color the towel's gonna be. I don't know anything. <laughs> so I go in, and they're like, "Okay, great." There's there's like six people and they're wonderful. And they're like, so we have the suit for you. And I'm like, oh great, the suit, like mm -hmm. the halo. Everybody wants to talk about the suit. So I have the suit, cool. So they're, they come in with the suit and they, it's this big, big rubber outfit, yeah. you know, chest piece with legs and boots and all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, okay, great. I'm not gonna be naked, this is perfect. And they're like, all right, so we're gonna try it on. So I start putting it on, put the pants on and the trousers on, and they're like, oh, no, 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 we forgot the, the undersuit. And I was like, oh, the undersuit, okay. They go out, they come back in a minute later, and they have basically a wetsuit, really? but it's a muscle yeah. wetsuit. <laughs> so it's got calf boosters, you know, bicep boosters, you know, huge pec boosters, 
but you know butt booster all these like pads it's this it's like floppy mrs doubtfire fucking wetsuit yeah. that i have to wear and i'm thinking why why the fuck am i working out every day for two hours if i'm putting this on you know which is killer i'm like what like i'm in pain right now from how much i've been working out and like i just want to eat some pizza yeah you know so the best part for me was hilarious that day i remember i'll never forget uh, I'm wearing red underpants and they're kind of silky, like these great underpants that I buy. They're mm-hmm. like, uh, they're called Airism from Uniqlo. They're amazing. Yeah. Anyway, I was wearing those at the time, but they're like red and this suit's black and it has a cutout for the crotch so that you can pee on, yeah. you know, on the day without having to like totally de-rig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I put, <laughs> I put this muscle suit on, which is black and Sticking out of the crotch is my red <laughs> underpants <laughs> with this room full of like 10 people and everyone's ignoring how awkward it is, you know? So I'm like, can we get the we have a photo? I wish I did. I was like, please let me get the pants, please. The 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 suit pants. So I put those on. <laughs> and we put this thing on. And dude, it looked amazing. Like, yeah. It was sick. And uh I loved it. It had, you know, all the the you know, the insignia and all this stuff. And uh it was cool. It was really cool. And the scars that we were talking about all went all on our face and, and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And um, the only thing was, dude, that suit was hot. Yeah. And this was, I think it was September, October, where we're in a studio and it's hot and we are melting, mm-hmm. like wearing all this stuff. And then... How long have you, have you had to shoot? So we shot for like a week. Oh, really? Yeah. But it was it was mainly inside the locker room. We come in, we taunt them. And then we had some other stuff scheduled to shoot, which they ended up changing. All right. So we didn't end up shooting anything, uh, anything like actiony, which was pretty yeah, disappointing. Yeah, yeah. I really wanted to do some action stuff. Yeah, because as, as I remember, well, let's not spoil it for anyone who didn't watch it. But I remember, I remember the locker room, room scene, and then there isn't, there, there aren't, <laughs> there aren't any of you left. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we get vaporized. And I had the script and I was like, dude, this is going to be so cool to shoot when we So there, there was planned like so there was action a, scene there where There was you... a plan where, you know, it's the, the battle and then the, what were they called? We were called Cobalt Team, but yeah. where the main team comes and, and finds us post battle, you know. But we didn't end up, sadly, ended up doing that. And uh, yeah, I mean, that was disappointing. Oh, but that's a shame. <laughs> you know, it's, it's par for the course. You know, I was happy to be on board. I was happy yeah. to be part of it. They were a great team. Everyone was really cool. But uh, yeah, no, the suit, I'll never forget. Everyone asked about the suit. And all I can remember is that crotch moment. And then my personal towel person, mm-hmm. whose job it was to follow me around the set, the wipe, wipe your- wiping the floor. Yeah. Where I was dripping sweat onto the floor so imagine, that no yeah. one wouldn't slip. So that I wouldn't slip. Because wow. I was literally dripping. Like, I think I probably lost 10, 20 pounds doing it. Oh, what is it in kilos? I don't know. Maybe <laughs> maybe like five to eight kg or something. <laughs> no, no, Ridiculous. no. You, you wouldn't. Yeah, I lost like, I definitely lost five kg. 100%. You think so? Well, yeah. I mean, I can imagine because I, w- I was losing one kg during one boxing training but yeah. it was just sweat i mean like yeah would, you, you water would, you, weight yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah, yeah no it was after a week of that i was trim <laughs> yeah all that muscle mass so Pablo schreiber how, how was working with him he was great yeah he was really cool he's really uh about the work so in the two weeks prior to when he's we, huge right he's big yeah. big dude i think he's like six five yeah but i mean he was mammoth like he was yoked for the show and we trained once or twice together And he was just on another level, mm. just unreal. We actually went to a, one of our training sessions, we went to a yoga class, oh, really? which was which was great. Not what I expected. Yeah. And we went to this yoga class and uh, yeah, he was he was good at yoga. He, yeah. You know? And yeah. I know, my wife's like a yogi. Oh, so I know yeah. when someone's good at yoga and he was yeah. good. Um, so that was cool. Yeah, because I remember him, like la- first time I noticed him, he was in uh, American Gods. Yeah, I think he was really good at it. He was one yeah. of my most favorite characters in, in, in that show. Have, have you watched you, it? I have. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen uh, 13 Hours? Yes. Yeah. He's so he's, he's yeah. amazing in that too. Yeah. Great character. Yeah. I remember that. I think he's a really good actor, and he is kind of like you can see that his work ethics and everything is like. Yeah. Top. Yeah. He came. I remember he was. He had a, another topless scene or something like that. And he came to a dinner where we were all sitting, uh, the Spartans. And he wasn't going to come, but he was like, oh, you guys are all meeting. I'm going to come. Mm. But he wasn't allowed to eat it. He wasn't eating. 
Yeah. So he came to the dinner and was like looking longingly at the rest of oh. us, enjoying our food. And he was like, no, I, I need to be, I can't eat. I have to film a topless scene. No, I mean, off. like I, I feel, I feel his pain, but at the same time, if I'd get paid so much money, I would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to do it. You got to yeah. do it. 100%. It's like because it's like it's your, it's your job, and it like I th- I'm pretty sure like his paycheck is pretty good on on that show. I can imagine. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, you got to do what you got to do. So yeah. But yeah. But he was what, what was cool about him is, and it actually I, I found this was kind of the first time I witnessed how invested he was in in the production as mm-hmm. a whole, as opposed to just like you know how much he cared. Yeah. Because he cared a lot. Because he came in and he was talking to us about our scenes, about other scenes that he was wasn't he, even was in. Was he a co-producer on this one or not? Uh, he may have been on season yeah. two. And he came in and he was he was curious about what was happening in the production and wanting to know. And the story. And he was saying, oh, well, what about this in the story? Well, maybe, you know, is that why this is happening? Mm. And it was unrelated to to what he was, yeah. what he had to do yeah. personally, yeah. you know. And I found that actually really inspiring because it's like when you're on a production and, and I'm learning about this now, when you're on a production, all the pieces matter, you know? And I think as a young actor, as a younger actor myself, all I thought about was, well, what's my character? What's what's my character got to do? Mm-hmm. How am I going to make my character stand out or whatever, as opposed to like serving the story, mm-hmm. which the question now, when I first get a piece of paper, that's a text for an audition, or if I get a part, I think my first thought is, how does this character serve the story? What yeah. is this character's duty to the overall structure and, and, and story arc? We should can't always be a judge of because just because sometimes if you don't get the if script, it's like some, something tiny and small and you just have no idea what's happening. Yeah, and so in, in that plays into it though, because if it is a smaller part, you then got to think about, well, what's the energy of this moment supposed to be? How does it fit into the tension of this episode or how can I make this be, you know, uh, what they needed to be the stepping stone they needed to be for this story, mm-hmm. right? Which is, it, it lends itself to being a new, it's a new approach when you approach a scene, you know, because you're not, you're not just thinking like, oh, maybe I'll smile here yeah. or, or this would be a good moment to think this before I say that line. You know, it's, you're thinking more like, What's the point? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I can memorize the lines. I can do the, the scene, but what's the point of it? Yeah. How does that scene fit? Mm-hmm. You know? So oftentimes I, I won't ask if I if I know I can't get a script if it's for like a top, you know, top secret production, I'll just say, can you just tell me how this moment slots into the overall? What's the importance of this moment? Does it always help you? To know that? Yeah. Yes and no. I think at a definitely if you're at a recall stage, mm-hmm. right? If they're not going to give you a script and you're in a recall, you need to know this. Mm-hmm. What's the point, right? And then no, because sometimes you want to do a tape that does just stand out. Yeah. In my opinion, you know, you want to do a tape. You can imagine they're getting 100 tapes, 200 tapes of this character. Mm-hmm. How is your tape going to look different or stand out? How's your performance going to be different to theirs? You got to think about that. And it sucks. You don't want to think about what's everyone else going to do. But, you know, in the old days, when you go into an audition and there'd be 10 people who look just like you in that audition and you hear through the paper thin walls what they're doing, you're now thinking, how do I not, how do I not do it like they just did it? (laughs) You know? Yeah. And, oh man, he, he fucked that line up. Or whatever. You're sitting there judging like a total asshole. Yeah. You know, but you have to remember they the the casting team is still doing that. They're still listening to hundred actors, two hundred actors do the same scene. Yeah. So, you know, you may not always want to, and I'm I'm no guru, but in my opinion, you may not always want to do what you think is written on the page yeah. necessarily, the way it's written, how it's written, because a lot of people are gonna do that. How you do. How do I do it? Yeah. What do you mean? I mean, like, well, well, when you get the tape, uh, when you get the self tape, what's like, how do you prepare for it? I look at, all right, when's it due? Okay. Who's the director? What, what's the character? What's, you know, what's the team, mm. the production team? And 
and I have an or like an order of you know importance that I go through. And at the end of the day, you got to get it in. And I have a, a strict rule that I get it in, and if I can, get it in early. So I do that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I know a lot of people have their own, you know, methods or whatever, but I, I memorize the lines just like the old fashioned way. I drill them in, I try not to do any, uh, you know, I try not to think about it too hard while I'm memorizing lines. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's, you don't have time to memorize the line. So you just have to like find the intention in the scene, find what you're trying to do. And then I think about, all right, who am I in this character? What's Nathan in mm -hmm. this role? How would Nathan behave in this situation? And I think like with self taping, you know, they're, they're looking at a lot. Sometimes they're not, but oftentimes they're looking at a lot. And I try not to do what I think they want. Yeah. I try to just do what I think's right for that scene. How I would see it if I was watching it on, on the screen, mm -hmm. you know, um, and then I hope I often I would rather have a recall with a director than just be given the part straight away. Oh, really? Honestly, yeah. It sounds crazy, but if you it get in the room, if you get in the room with the director and you can have that recall, and he says or she says, "This is what I'm thinking here in that line," throw that line away or whatever, and they give you specific directions. That to me is so much more rewarding than showing up on set, not really sure what the director wants. Mm -hmm. You may not even get a conversation and they say action. Well, ideally you, you would have at least like one or two rehearsals. Yeah, hope ideally, yeah. but you know, I've been on jobs where you don't, Yeah. you know, and they just say like, this is what's, this is what you got to do, do it. And you're like- Big jobs, small jobs, medium. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All of the above? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think often on smaller jobs, you do get, you get that time to, to talk with the director and stuff. But, you know, I've, I've done a couple where you've memorized it. They've changed the lines the day before. Mm -hmm. And you're like, damn, I memorized this like a week ago. And I had a whole plan. And now you've changed the lines. Yeah. And you have to be like, all right, these are the new lines. Mm -hmm. You know? Oh, and this scene's changed? Oh, now I'm not in this scene? What the fuck? <laughs> You know, and then you're like, well, I'm here. What am I shooting? And then you get the sides the next day and then you go in and you're like, okay, I got these. I, I think I got these. I'm just going to try and, you know, at that point you're on set. So you've got a character in your mind. You've got, you've got his behaviors. You've got his mannerisms, whatever. Then you have to be free to do that. But that's, that's way scarier. Yeah. If you get in the room in the recall and then hopefully you book the part, at least you've had that conversation with the director or with the producer or whoever showrunner, you've had that chat initially. So you're on the same page and then you book the job, you're walking into it and you have the confidence knowing like, we talked about this because we may not get the time to talk about it on the day, mm. you know? Yeah. Like yeah. Halo, dude, with Halo, I didn't have a recall and I went in there and there's 10 people in a room doing a scene. So the first, one of the first times I met some of the actors was in the blocking rehearsal. Yeah. And they're like, run the lines while we do this. That's scary. Yeah. You know? But they're, they're a big production. They're, they're, they have, they don't have a lot of time. Yeah. You know, there was no, no chance for us to kind of, you know, that's why we went for dinner, but not everyone was at, you know, the dinner and, and a couple of other meetings we had just to t talk it through. And so you're going on set and you're like, damn, I don't want to screw this up. Of course. I'm scared. Mm -hmm. You know? I hope I can remember my lines. Hopefully they haven't changed the lines, <laughs> but you haven't had the chat. You know, you haven't had any chat with the director. So that, that's what I mean. Like that's scary. Yeah. Luckily it was fine. We had a great team on Halo and, and we all banded together and we, do, we got it done. But, but yeah, it's like, it feels, it feels better having a recall with a director, you know, of yeah, course it's, I mean, it's great. You get the job without a recall that I'm, I'm not. Yeah. Obviously that's awesome. Yeah. But you're then left wondering in that time when you book, to when you film, am I gonna get a rehearsal? Mm. Is it annoying if I send the director an email? Can I send the director? Mm. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, yeah, because the director's got so many things going on and they're like, oh, this guy doesn't know what to do. That's annoying. Yeah, but you know? like, you kind of like, if they booked you, they kind of already saw something that they want in you, ideally. They would book you if they want something completely different. So it kind of gives you a little bit of, you know, insurance in a yeah, way. Yeah, for sure. But at the same time, yeah, are, are you still like getting nervous when you get on a new set or or theater play? Honestly, uh, 
a play, yeah, I think I would be nervous. I haven't been on stage in a while, but but I think I'm I'm lucky to be in a position now where I I walk on set and I feel a sense of confidence that I haven't felt, you know, recently. Mm-hmm. I have this confidence, and you know, I think it stems from a few things, but but I think that you uh, now I walk on set and I I know what my job is as an yeah. actor, and I know what people are expecting of me. Mm. And if I've prepared, I'm typically not, not too nervous. Yeah. You know, like I, I was on, I was on Downton mm-hmm. over the summer. I filmed uh, a couple of days on Downton and that's a huge world. Downton Abbey. Downton Abbey. So we did Downton three and that's a huge world. A yeah. lot of expectation, a lot of people, everyone already knows each other. I was playing a, a relatively important character, small character, integral to the story. And I walk in on set and everybody already knows each other. The director has a rapport with all the actors. The producer knows everyone. They have all these stories. They've done three movies and a TV show. They, everyone knows each other. So I walked on and I felt that pressure, that mm-hmm. sense of nervousness of like, um, am I going to screw this up? Mm -hmm. You know, like this is an important moment in the story. Am I going to mess it up? And, you know, you, everyone has their own like weird superstitions and techniques and stuff, but you focus on the lines, you focus on what you need to do and you just simplify. What's my relationship to the person I'm talking to? You know, how do I know them? What am I doing here? How, you know, the, the who, what, where, why, how, all these questions you ask, And you just focus on that. And I think if you're prepped and you're focused and you kind of, you know, there's a great movie with uh, Kevin Costner called For the Love of the Game, Mm -hmm. um, baseball movie. And he's a pitcher. And he does this amazing thing. His character does this amazing thing when he's pitching a perfect game. So a game where no one's gotten any hits off of him. And he's in the twilight of his career. It's an amazing film if you haven't seen it. I love it anyway. (laughs) And... He does this amazing thing that always stayed with me. His character goes, clear the mechanism. And when he says, when he says that to himself, his mantra, all this noise of the stadium, everything, it all goes away and he's hyper-focused. Yeah. And he focuses on the next pitch, what he has to do, and it's silent. Mm. And I love that. So I try to do that. I'm, <laughs> it's not theatrical, it's not cinematic, obviously, but I just try to laser focus on what I'm doing, you know, the attitude and the mood that that character is in, and I clear the mechanism, forget about all this other noise. If I don't bring my phone to set. I just think, what, do I, what am I doing right now? How do I serve the story? And what's the, what's the objective? What am mm-hmm. I doing here? You know, what do I need to say? Yeah. You know, and that's hard. Like, that, that's, that's not easy. And sometimes, you know, you forget or you don't do it or, you stress out or you get anxious and but yeah on those on those rare occasions i will get nervous have you got used to watching yourself That's watching great. myself yeah no <laughs> i mean you do obviously now it's like you know with self tapes you're like oh man i have a booger <laughs> you know you're like that whole take was great except i have a booger <laughs> it happened yeah you know like you're like damn it you know so you're like all right so you get you <laughs> that you know that hopefully doesn't happen on a big film or anything but like you do i guess i get used to it a little bit but it's that thing of like if you see something you've done it and you haven't thought about it in ages and then you you look at it on the screen you know hmm. and you're like they used that take <laughs> Because you remember all it takes. Even if there's 20, you f- you remember them, you know? <laughs> yeah. So it's tough because you're like, you're not there in the editing room to say like, oh, no, come on. But this is this is better because that's what I'm thinking, there, yeah. you know, or whatever. But yeah, so it's it's tough because you don't have, once you do your, your day, mm-hmm. you know, you don't have any control over it. Anymore, no, of course. Really, yeah. you know. How often, like, how often are you happy or unhappy with what you see on screen when you when you do the job? more more unhappy yeah. often than happy really you know? and it's not it's nothing like i'm just I, i think i'm a little bit of a perfectionist and and i want you yeah. know i want it to be perfect yeah do you think you can be objective about it no 
That's that's the thing because I noticed for myself as well. Like there were there were quite a few times when I was really unhappy with what I did, and then everyone was so com- complimentary about it. Like and the director was really happy about it. I was like, I gotta trust the director, but fuck, come on, I don't like what I see here. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you gotta trust them. You gotta trust that they that they're you know, seeing something that you're not feeling or you're not seeing. And, you know, I think a lot of actors now, you know, they'll go and they'll, they'll watch the monitor after they've done a take. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do that. Yeah. You know, you have to do it for self tapes. You have to be like, all right, this one, you know, I don't have a booger, so I got to send that one, you know, but, but when you're there in the moment, you know, it's, I think it it would throw me a little bit, Mm -hmm. you know, because what happens then for me is I stop looking at it as a performer and I start looking at it as a filmmaker, Mm -hmm. right? If you're looking at your performance while you're performing, you know, you're like, you're suddenly going, oh, well, shouldn't that character in the background be facing the other way? (laughs) Or shouldn't you be like, shouldn't I have a different shirt on or something, you know, like you're thinking about it more now as a filmmaker, which, you know, if you're directing your own film and performing in it, that's one thing. But if you're just an actor on a film, just trust your team. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Let the team decide, you know. And that can be hard to do, you know? Sometimes you don't have trust in your team, which often, you know, often you do, but sometimes you don't. Mm -hmm. And so I I still think in those moments, you gotta just let it go. Yeah. And just, and do what you are doing and hope that someone's there that's gonna say, hey, you know, turn your head on this line or don't smile there or whatever, you know? Yeah, I know, but I know it's like, it's just, sometimes it's just hard to switch it off. Yeah, it's that like third eye thing, you know, that bird's eye view you have of yourself. Like, you know, I'm having it right now while we're having this conversation. Like Mm -hmm. you're wondering, how am I looking? (laughs) Do I sound stupid? You know, you got to turn all that off. Yeah. Which is so hard to do. You know, Mm -hmm. I was doing a tape the other day, actually, and I caught myself doing it in the tape. Mm -hmm. I, I, I finished the take and immediately deleted it. And said, I'm not, I'm not present in that one. Yeah. So let's do another one. I need to just think about what I'm saying to you, connect with you in your eyes and, and have this, have this scene and stop thinking about it as that sounds like shit or that looks stupid Mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, and just, just try it. And it's hard to do, especially on your own. Yeah. Especially if you're working with somebody on a zoom call or something who's reading in for you or whatever, you know, it's, it's hard to do that, but you know, and I'm not, like I said, I'm not a guru of it, but I just try to turn that off and focus on the character not the like damn can they hear the scaffolding outside yeah have you have you learned how to deal with rejection yeah 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 i think i've (laughs) i know i'm not done facing it you know i'll never be done and that's the thing dude i think like i don't know my personal opinion about like being an actor and all that stuff is that it i try not to let it uh, I try not to let it define me. You know, I like to think of myself as more than just an actor, you know, mm-hmm. like I, I'm, I'm producing something right now. I have another thing I want to try and produce, uh, before Christmas, I work with, with a casting director, you know, so I'm doing, I'm doing a lot more stuff than just being an actor. I couldn't pay my bills if I was just an actor, you know, mm-hmm. it's not consistent enough. Not when you have two kids, if I had a small apartment somewhere and just rode my bicycle everywhere and didn't have a car and all this stuff, that'd be fine. But, you know, so when it comes to like rejection, I, I try not to dwell. I don't dwell on it, you know, and oftentimes you get rejected without being rejected. Mm -hmm. You know, it's rare now they're like instituting these programs or these, you know, uh, elements on like a a casting where you can find out, you can track the status of the role and then they'll tell you, oh, this role has been cast. That's new. You know, that's only come in within the last couple of years, um, you know, because most of the time you just don't hear shit. Yeah. You know, so when it comes to rejection, it's it's like. It's such a hard lesson to try to tell someone this is how you should deal with rejection because everybody's going to deal with it in their own way, you know? Yeah. And I think it's like. It's just a question of moving forward. You just move forward. You just wait. I just wait for if, if I don't hear anything, that's fine. I just wait for the next tape and I focus on that and trying to let it go. Yeah. You know. But the, how how much time did you need to kind of come to this? 
to get to this. I mean, I'm 36 now, so, you know, it, it mattered a lot more, you yeah. know, when I was younger, like, you know, my twenties and stuff. And you know, you'd go up for a part and you'd be like, damn, I smashed that audition, you know? And everyone's got stories. Everyone's got stories where, you know, the director told them they had the part and then they didn't get the part. And you're like, what? You know, everyone's got stories like that. And like, it sucks, but it's, it's not for everyone, mm -hmm. you know? And who knows, dude, I may, I may never act again. <laughs> I have, there's a, there's a guy I know, one of my original uh, mentors, this amazing guy, he's still an actor, but uh, he told me when I was applying for acting school, he said, this is a dumb idea. Don't do this. Acting is the worst life ever. Mm -hmm. Don't be an actor. And of course, like 18 year old me was like, fuck you, man. I'm gonna do this show, I'm gonna prove you wrong, I'm gonna prove everyone wrong, motherfucker. You know? Yeah. But <clears throat> what he was trying to say, which I fully appreciate, is, is there's no guarantees, there's no certainty, there's no stability, there's no none of that stuff. Like you can't, you can't, there's no formula. It's not like, all right, I'm a clerk in a grocery store, I'm gonna work my way up, become the head clerk, become the manager, become the owner, whatever. Yeah. There's no trajectory, there's no ceiling, there's no roof, there's no start, there's no finish. It's just, it is just occurring constantly. And sometimes you're gonna, you're gonna be in something and sometimes you're not, you know? And more often than not, probably not. <laughs> yeah, probably not, you know, and that sucks. Yeah. You know, and I think a lot of people, it's, but it's, 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 it's a blessing and a curse, you know? Cause like you can, you can look at it like, if I don't get this part, I'm gonna quit, mm. I'm done. I'm hanging up. And I went through a stage like that. Yeah. I really did. You know, I, when was it? I would say like five, six years ago, I was really, you know, unsure about everything. My kids were coming into the world and I was like, do I want to be, you know, this struggling actor in my kids' eyes? Like, do I want to be, do I want them to see me as like this unhappy, grouchy guy who's complaining about this, that, and the other mm. thing in the acting world. Like, is that who I want them to see me as? Am I gonna give up acting and find something new? And I almost did. Mm. I, I was looking at applications to go back to university and study, I was gonna study uh, sustainability and, and become something else, something totally different, mm. you know? And I'm all about that stuff. Like I love sustainability and, you know, helping the ecosystem and all that stuff. But I faced that challenge and I don't know. I mean, there's, I think there was a, there was a big part of me that was like ready to stop. Yeah. You know, and just give it up. And you were doing this by that time, how long? I, I, I at that point I had probably been an actor for like working on professional projects, not like counting high school and stuff, probably for like 12 years. Mm. You know, 10, 12 years at that point. Yeah. You know? It's quite quite a chunk of your life. Yeah. That you suddenly think like it's... I've dedicated 10 years of my life to being an actor. Yeah. I have so many such and such credits, whatever. Mm -hmm. And what am I going to do now? Maybe I'll just, just throw in the towel and, and stop and stop caring. Yeah. Like, and it's tough. Like, it's like, because it's an addiction in some ways. It's an obsession in some ways. You know, I, for me, it would be so severe yeah. because... I see the movies and I think like, damn, he played that scene really well, or that was a really cool shot mm -hmm. or like whatever, you know, and I see it on stage and I'm like, damn, why would he cross there? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm like, my brain is constantly, th but if I would find it so much uh, more difficult to enjoy entertainment mm -hmm. as a not actor. Yeah. Cause I, the perfect example are my two brothers, mm -hmm. they went, they tried to become professional baseball players and now neither of them are. They still play, like in their free time, they play occasionally. But, you know, I think about them because similarly to acting, if you stopped the way they stopped baseball, it's very hard to come to terms with that because that's like what you, your personal life path was until it was no longer, right? Mm -hmm. So without that sort of closure, because there's no closure. There is rejection. You yeah. didn't get this part, but that doesn't mean, and you'll never get any more parts ever again, you know? So 
like going back to your original question, when rejection comes or doesn't come in the form of omission or whatever, it's your choice to go, all right, I'll just wait for the next one. Or it's your choice to be like, I'll never work again, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's your choice to have a sense of humor about it. Mm -hmm. Your attitude is your choice, you know? And it's, dude, it's not personal. It definitely can be, mm -hmm. but nine times out of 10, it's not, mm -hmm. you know? So I just remember that and I just let it, I try to let it go. These are like a bunch of things that run through your head and you're like, all right, whatever. Yeah. You know? What stopped you for, from, from, from quitting? quitting? Yeah. I think uh, I like a knowledge of, I'm, I was scared of who I would become mm -hmm. like personally on the other side. Because who I am now as an actor, I'm, I'm, I'm very... As, an, as, as, a, as a person, not just as an actor, I'm very self-aware. Mm -hmm. Like I know who I am, I know what my principles are, what I'm about and all that stuff, but it would feel like a piece of me was missing if I wasn't doing it, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Without sounding like a cliche or like, oh, this is who I'm meant to be mm. or anything like that. It's just like, it's just, I have to keep it there. I have to allow it to be, you know, a, a plant in my garden. Because if I just remove the plant, then I feel like the garden being my personality is, is missing something. Are you happier when you perform? Yeah, sometimes, but <laughs> sometimes not. Because <laughs> you're like, this is the worst production on the planet. What am I doing here? You know, <laughs> how did I say yes to this? <laughs> you know, a paycheck. <laughs> yeah. You're like, is this worth it? Is this really worth it? Well, you know, like, is this going to go on my CV or not? <laughs> the thing is, most actors can't really be too choosy about the jobs. Yeah. Not, not everyone is Tom Cruise, you know. Not Dude, everyone. absolutely. You know, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not particularly choosy. Obviously, this stuff comes along and I'm like, I, I can't see myself doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm scared to audition. And I've done, I've done a couple auditions before where I'm like, if I get this, like, I'm probably going to say no. Mm -hmm. Really? Like I'm, I'm not, yeah. Like some stuff, like just projects you just don't, uh, you know, because like that question I was saying before a self tape, what's the point? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes, especially with theater, you, you have to ask, what's the point of this? Is this just like a gratuitous display of, of sexuality? Is this just like trying to sell, you know, tickets? So you're going to get a bunch of people to do like a bunch of silly stuff that, you know, it's just meaningless gratuity, mm -hmm. you know? What's the point of doing this play now or this film or whatever now? How does this, you know, how does this relate to what's currently happening in society or, you know, what's an audience gonna look at this play and think? Yeah. And if those things are like wildly off, then I'll say no. Mm -hmm. Where's the line for you? Is there anything that like you'd know for sure, like I would never do that? No, I don't know. I'm not saying there is no line. Um, <laughs> but everything in context. Yeah, I think everything in context. Uh, in context, I think if it's uh, like I said, if it serves the piece, like if if it's completely necessary, you know, if it's like full frontal nudity or something, mm -hmm. but it's like this is what this is the scene, like it has to be. Yeah. Otherwise, the rest of the story doesn't make sense. Then that's just like you just gotta get your balls out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, you know, if you're like, fuck, it's paying half a mil, yeah. you know, or something like, I, <laughs> but I got to get my balls out. Damn. All right. You know, I would like to think that in that, you know, theoretical situation, that would be my main concern. But, <laughs> you know, I'm only human, you know, everybody's got their, their, you know, everybody's got their insecurities. And like, I think I wouldn't want to do something that would like be promoting something I didn't align with politically yeah. necessarily, yeah. you know, for the wrong reasons. Mm. You know what I mean? It's circumstantial, I think. Can you remember and talk about any mistakes that you did, like that you think, like you look back now, you're like, yeah, that was a mistake that I did that. And if you learned anything on it, like <laughs> yeah. acting wise and professionally, like, sure. yeah. This one time in theater, I went for a beer between shows. And that turned into two beers. Mm -hmm. And I was, I didn't have a lot to eat. 
<laughs> and they were they were steins <laughs> and uh so four beers we're yeah. talking about four beers I hadn't had a lot to eat and this was between shows and i was cavalier and i thought i'll be fine and i walked out on stage inebriated and i had a huge monologue mm -hmm. and i walked out on stage and was like damn i am not okay you know <laughs> this was a fucking mistake yeah and I'll never do it again. Yeah. Like ever, you know, and I know there's like greats, you know, there's these stories about people who all oh, we do a shot before that scene or whatever else. Yeah. Uh, it's all fine, I suppose, but it, it doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. Like I, so I, I made that mistake on, in, in a show once and it was a professional show. Like it was a real show and I shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. And that was all I needed one once. And I was like, I'll never do this again. Yeah. You know? Um, and, uh, you know, you think you're a hot shot and stuff and you can handle it. And then you're like, hey, I'm, I'm not fucking this up, but this is terrible. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> this is some terrible quality work that I'm putting out right now. Um, so that was like a theater mistake. But yeah, like like on, um, I remember on my, on Burton Dickey, on the Matt Smith film. First moment, never had a, an acting class for camera ever. Mm. Didn't know anything. Oh, really? Yeah, never. And uh, I just thought, like, whatever, just do the scene, be in your costume and just do the scene. Like, they're going to take care of everything else, right? Hmm. You know, and I'm so far from that now. But um, so I'll never forget Burton Dickey with Matt Smith, the first thing. And this scene actually was with this amazing actor called Ron Cook, who I love. He's, he's so cool. Anyway, so Ron is standing there and he's got 10 people behind him. And this the scene the setup of the scene is i'm an american r rower mm. and i've come in to row in the olympics and i'm staying with this family in their house because post world war ii england had been you know completely flattened by the blitz and so they were rebuilding their society and, and london was you know poor yeah so they called it the austerity games so in this scene i'm, I'm staying with this this family and they have scraped together this meal, this like really nice steak dinner meal. I gotta eat the steak. And I don't know how to, am I supposed to actually eat it? Like, mm -hmm. and I'm too embarrassed to ask anyone what I'm supposed to do, mm -hmm. right? And they've already been shooting. Like I wasn't first up on the day. So they'd shot crowd, mm -hmm. they'd shot, you know, establishing shots and whatever. And I sit down, they're like, you sit here. And I'm like, all right, so I sit down there and I pick the napkin up, I have my handkerchief here, and I pick the napkin up off the plate, go like that, put it on my lap. And I'm like, all right. And the whole team was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what? What happened? What'd I do? Uh, and they were like, they were like, dude, uh, we'll just, we'll set it again uh, after we shoot. And I was like, said what, what happened? And I'm so embarrassed, you know? And this was the first, I think this was the first time I'd ever, I'd shot some crazy shit before mm. like in New York, but this was like the first proper, yeah. you know, a hundred people on set, 20 people like in my mm. face, makeup, whatever, you know? And I picked up this napkin and put it on my lap and the whole crew was like, oh God damn it. And I was like, what happened? I had no idea what I'd done wrong, you know? But they obviously had set the table a certain way and continuity was now screwed up. Yeah. You know? So you learn shit like that. So they're like, it's fine, don't worry. I think they kind of knew I was pretty green. Mm -hmm. And they were like, you know, it's fine, don't worry about it. But I was like, and then I was like, damn, you know, there's so much here that I don't know. Yeah. So I gotta figure this shit out, you know? But you do. You do. Yeah, In time you eventually. do. And if you if you get to work, you do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the thing. Like uh, I remember we were doing class in working at the studio. And you don't almost never, even when you get screen acting classes, almost never you actually do like a full class on continuity. Yeah. Just like to teach you, because I remember we were doing this class and we were doing a scene, and then Lee was like, okay, now Everyone who sits here, you just have to remember what they do in the scene. And then you tell them. And when you do that, like, you know, when you're in the moment, you do the scene, like, you sometimes you're like, and you, you don't even pay attention to how you move. Yeah. How you move. And, and, and then later, like, okay, so here you turn here, here you turn here, then you touch your hair, then you did this. And you're like, fuck. 
And it it's it becomes your responsibility yeah. as the actor. Yeah, that's the it's thing. It's one hundred percent your responsibility, yes. and that's one of the things that I don't rely on other people to do. And that took time to learn. Yeah, because then when you see the final product or you see something or you have to go do ADR for a project, mm-hmm. and it's like they're like, well, because you turned your head and looked at so and so while so and so over here was talking, and now the continuity screwed up. Yeah, and you're like. But I was just doing that for that one take, mm-hmm. and it's like no. I think with certain aspects of when you're when you're filming something, you have to maintain the same thing. Yeah. Whether that's holding your phone in your right hand, definitely. Yeah. You know, that's why they don't like people eating in scenes. That's yeah. why they don't like. It, it's hard to Smoking shoot. Smoking and then eating. I remember. Yeah. Honestly, I remember once I had like I was doing the short film. I smoked probably half a pack of cigarettes in. In two hours, while we're doing one, one like basically, one like shot. A, yeah, one one scene, like different shots, and then at some point, it was my responsibility to kind of like break the cigarette and light it, like just a half of it, because I remember it was like half half full yeah. smoking by the, by that point. It's your responsibility. So yeah, so like, you I don't, have to remember that. Yeah, you have to. You can't depend on other people because mm. if you, it looks just looks bad on you, mm. and it, especially now nowadays with like TV shows and stuff like that, where so much is in the in in the balance, mm-hmm. when what I mean is like, you could get, let's say you get a character on a TV show and they're like, all right, this is an open-ended contract where right now you have two episodes, but we'll see what happens. Mm-hmm. And often it's like that because the writers haven't finished the series or whatever's going on. So you want to show up on set and show them that not only do you know what you're doing, that you're a nice person, you're a good person to work with, and you can be there long-term, mm-hmm. right? You're not complicated, you're not a diva, Whatever, and there's all these like politics that like play into it, you know. There's all these like relationships that you need to be managing, and and I mean, for me, I like to think of myself as like a nice dude, so I'm polite to everyone. I'm I'm always gracious and 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 trying to be courteous to everyone, you know. And that's not easy to do. Sometimes, yeah. You know, sometimes, you know, often if you if you're working on a nice production, they'll send a car to pick you up and. If you've got to do a scene that day that's super emotional or super intense, kind of the last thing you want to do is like have a chit chat with mm-hmm. anyone. And sometimes, you know, you just have to say as respectfully as you can, like let's say to the driver or something, hey, like, hey man, no, no offense, or mm-hmm. I just really need to focus this morning on this stuff. You know, thank you so much for picking me up or whatever. Mm-hmm. And you have to be polite. You have to maintain that. And they, they will respect that, you know. And there's only so much of yourself that you can give. You know, you've got to keep that kind of energy or whatever in the moment on those on those days. You anyone know? can have a bad day. As well. Everyone has bad it's days. Just, yeah, it's you know. Yeah, uh, you worked with Anthony Hopkins as well. Yeah. How was it? How was the experience? That that was pretty amazing. Yeah. Honestly, that was one of my first jobs. It was well. Red Two, yeah. Red Two, yeah. He was uh, he was so cool. Yeah. Honestly, and I'm not just saying that because you know he's a legend and all that, but which he is he is 100 percent a legend yeah. he uh <clears throat> he was just beyond generous and he is not some crazy you know star like diva or anything like mm-hmm. that you know he's just a guy yeah and he's a nice guy and i remember i so it was i was mortified mortified and i'll never forget the casting director um beautiful cast director called elaine granger she was like, we need somebody who's not going to be intimidated by our star. And I was like, I'm your guy. I had no idea who it was, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but you're like, I'm not intimidated by fucking anyone, you yeah. know? And you're like, all right. And the scene was pretty straightforward. It was just a soldier and there's a criminal and the criminal gets out and you have to try and stop the criminal. And so it was a scene and I remember I went into Elaine's offices in Soho and uh, did the scene and did the, the there was an in-person audition and which was yeah. always good. Read with, with uh, I think, yeah, the director, Dean Pariso wasn't there, but Elaine was there and we did the scene. And a couple of days later, I got the call saying, you got the job. And that was amazing. Nice. The person is Anthony Hopkins. Mm-hmm. And I was like, fuck, damn, <laughs> <laughs> fuck, <laughs> you know? And, and, uh, this was my, this was my second or third film job. And, uh, and I was like, okay, okay, I can do this. Like I, 
straightforward. Like I just pull a gun, say, hey, what are you doing? Da, da, da. Scene's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. But I'm nervous, you know, because it's Anthony Hopkins. Go to set. I'm in the makeup trailer. And I'm doing my makeup. They're doing not much, whatever, combing my hair. And uh, it's four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning. And then I hear, Nathan, is Nathan in that? Where's Nathan? And it's fucking Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> He's like, Nathan Wiley, where is he? And I'm like, oh my God, this is happening. <laughs> And he comes in and he comes and he sits down next to me and he's got like a couple of people with him, his team or whatever. It's, you know, obviously some PA was like trying to wrangle him and take him somewhere. And he was like, no. <laughs> and he comes and finds me and he's like, sits down right here. And he's like, right in my face. He's like, it's so nice to meet you. And he's like, I can't do an Anthony Hopkins impression, but he's like, it's so nice to meet mm -hmm. you. I've been listening to your music all morning. And I was like, <laughs> I like swallowed and I was like, oh, and in my head, I'm thinking, damn, I got to tell Anthony Hopkins that he looked up the wrong Nathan Wiley. <laughs> Just so you know, if you don't know, there is a musician, Nathan Wiley. <laughs> yeah, he's Canadian and he's very good. And my, I tip my hat to him. No, no worries, bro. But Change your is, name if you want. That, that'd be great. He's much older than you, though, as well. No, we have the same complexion. Yeah. Okay. And he's this, he's a, he's a folk singer and he's great. Yeah. His music's great. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, Anthony Hopkins is so stoked. <laughs> he's like, dude, your music's amazing. It's so poetic and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, fuck my life, you know? And so I said to him, I was like, I said to him, I said, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really sorry, Mr. Hopkins. He's like, shut up, shut up. Call me Tony. Call me Tony. I'm like, all right, I'm I'm really sorry, Tony, but oh, he goes. I remember he was like, "Did you fly in from Canada?" <laughs> I was like, oh, this hurts, you know. I was like, I'm so sorry, Tony. It's I'm not that Nathan Wiley, mm -hmm. and I just remember him being so crestfallen, you know. He was like, oh. <laughs> like on this massive, <laughs> massive disappointment, you know, so disappointed. He wanted to talk poetry and music and all this stuff with me. And I'm like, dude, I can play baseball. Like I can surf. <laughs> and this was it. So I felt awful, you know, and, and I was like, you know, I'm, you know, it's a wrong, wrong Nathan Wiley or whatever. And he was like, he took him in and he, he took that in and was like, well, you know, processing mm -hmm. whatever that meant to him. And, and. And then he fully snapped out. He fully recovered. He was like, oh, my mistake. I'm so sorry. But anyway, it's so nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. You know, where are you from? We had this great conversation. He sat right there, talked mm -hmm. to me for 15 minutes. Yeah, you know? yeah. And then we parted ways and got ready, came back on set. And we had a long day. It was a long day. There was a lot of extras. We're on this plane in this airport. It's fucking freezing. And we're on this, uh, we're on this plane. And in between shots they're doing like establishing this whatever whatever in between shots we have a green room tent and we go into this green room and there's a handful of other actors there too and uh, a great actor called neil mcdonough was there as well and uh he's he's amazing i have another story about him but he um he anthony hopkins and i were sitting in this tent and we spent the day because there wasn't a lot of like dialogue to do. It was more technical stuff. Yeah. We spent the entire day in this tent together, back and forth, talking literature, films, history, like history was a big one, poetry, just talking about all this stuff. And Hopkins is just so cool and so generous and was like genuinely engaged. We're talking about all this other stuff, nothing to do with the movie. Mm -hmm. And it was just bliss. Like I just yeah. spent the day with, with these guys, with Anthony Hopkins, with Neil McDonough. And we go into film. And this is really cool. We go into film and they're running low on time. This has taken way too long. They're, they're not us, but the extras, the plane, the specifics, the sound, whatever, they're behind mm -hmm. on the day. And the DP and I can't remember who, somebody on the film, I don't remember exactly who it was. They set up and they, they, they did the shots of, of Hopkins in the cage. He's in the cage and in the scene, he basically has a little doohickey in his shoe pulls out a toxic gas, drops it on the floor, and we all die. 
but I catch him before he drops the gas and I tell him, I try to stop him. What are you doing? Whatever. We film everything on Tony with like my pistol arm coming through, like, you know, dirtying the shot. We film everything on him and they're like, great, let's move on. They've done no coverage of me. And I don't know, it probably wasn't intentional, but I will never forget Tony turns around and he goes, no, we got to film Nathan. Nice. And he's like, we're filming Nathan. We need it for the scene. So they were like, oh shit, okay. And they switched around. And then I got a couple close-ups. Yeah. Because of Anthony Hawkins. Nice. So I'll never forget that, dude. That was huge. Yeah. You know, for for me, I was probably 23 or something at the time. And it was just Mm. like, what a fucking legend. You know, that Mm. was cool. And honestly, like having seen like that on the uh, on the on your showreel, yeah, it's amazing. No, I mean it was it was cool. You know, yeah. it's Anthony Hopkins. He's in a cage, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like, oh my god, this is classic. Mm. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, I, I he, <laughs> he didn't like he knew the lines, but he just kind of said his interpretation of the lines, which was just beautiful. Mm-hmm. And he was free. Yeah, and he was just you know saying. He said, I remember he said something like, you shouldn't point that silly thing at me. I think the line was, don't point the gun at me, mm-hmm. you know? And it was like, that's way better. Yes. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it, I mean, it was just a treat, dude. Red 2 was cool. That was a cool experience. The funny thing, Google still does, doesn't know, uh, doesn't, you know, know who you are or <laughs> that makes no wily. Yeah. <laughs> because when, it's I, when I Googled you, when I was preparing for a podcast, like, like the musician, director, Yeah, yeah, I think it's so confused. If you type in my name, it says Nathan Wiley, my picture, but then it says musician. Yes. We'll change that. It'll it'll happen. It's coming. What would be your your most favorite project you've been in? Most favorite? I mean, that that play I mentioned, uh, The Glass Menagerie, was directed by David Thacker. Mm -hmm. And we had... uh, we had Margot Lester and, and uh, Fiona Hampton in it. She's amazing. She's a good friend of mine. And Kieran Hill and the four of us together. We just, that was like, it was perfect. Fiona was on the... She the, was, yeah, she was in The Good Neighbor. Yeah, yeah. I also I have scenes with her as well. <laughs> yeah, she's amazing, dude, yeah. as you know. Yeah. Like, filmically, I had a really good experience on the film The Program mm-hmm. with Chris O'Dowd and Ben Foster. And, and Stephen Freer's directing. I mean, that was a lot of fun. And I think at that point, I had definitely gotten enough confidence to kind of be like, I, I should be here. I yeah. know what I'm doing here. And now I have a little bit of like play. Mm-hmm. I can play a little bit. Yeah. You know, I, ha- I remember feeling that on that production. Um, I think that was 2014. So yeah, that I had a lot of fun on. But I mean, Good Neighbor was a lot of fun too. Definitely, uh, definitely an independent film <laughs> with some some minor financial drawbacks, but yeah. we had fun. We had a great yeah. time, you know. Yeah, it was good. It, for me, it was my very first film. Yeah, yeah, and I remember like I I, I don't use any any of my shots in in my showreel because I'm really unhappy with what I did there. And just I mean, really? like it was my first for first first. Dude, uh, the scene where you're chopping logs. Yeah. That scene's so funny, dude. What yeah. are you talking about? I kind of look at it again, honestly, because I remember when I was watching it, I was like, oh my God, everyone is so amazing. That's so shit. Shit. <laughs> shit. I think, honestly, because right now, like, it's so much time has passed. And, like, I, I know that I'm way better actor right now than I was then, back then. And I'm sure, I don't know, maybe, maybe I need to watch it again. Because, you know what? Watch it again. Because you, I, I love that scene where she comes up to you and says, you got to do all this stuff or whatever. And then, you yeah, know, like, uh, you're like, who's going to tell her? You tell her, mm-hmm. you know? Dude, that scene is great. And I know it's in it's in Russian, right? Yeah. And it's it's still yeah. it's really great. It's funny. Like your timing's perfect. Okay, okay, I gotta yeah. I gotta watch it again. Maybe I need to add it to my 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 showreel. Yeah. yeah. Did you think about going back on stage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really want to. I really mm-hmm. want to. I, I had an audition recently for something, but um but I couldn't do it. It it, it conflicted with like a family thing and uh I got to the recall stage and I just said, hey, listen, I got to be honest. I, I genuinely can't miss this family function. So mm. I want to tell you that at the, at the outset. Um, and they were like, thanks so much. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> I 
else. <laughs> well, at least I know. At least yeah. I know. You know. Yeah. But yeah, I do. I do really want to go back to 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 do a play. I I really do. Because you get you know you get you get in the rhythm. You get that sense of like, all right, this is a big. It's commitment. It's stability. You know, you have. It's not it's a lot paid. of money, but it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if it's paid, it's stability because when you do fringe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know what you're gonna do for for whatever time you know you're doing it for two months, three months. You're like, all right, I have to be here every night at six. And for when you have kids, having that sense of routine is great. Mm-hmm. You know, to suddenly turn around when let's say you know they have a they have a football game or they have an important event like a play. You know, my my little one does uh, dance so. Mm-hmm. To turn around and be like, you know, the dance show that we've been practicing for, eh, well, I can't go anymore because I have to go to Hungary yeah. to film something. You know, that's that's tough. You know, and that's I think that's that's a sacrifice. You know, it's obviously great you get to go film something, but mm. you know, your kids, like for me, my kids are my world. So like, you know, having a sense of routine doing a play, at least they know, like, all right, dad can pick us up from school. He's gonna pick us up every day. We don't get story time or whatever now but at least we have breakfast with them you know what i mean and they they can, can they can count on that because kids need routine they need mm-hmm. consistency so that's that's a nice aspect of doing a play yeah you know if the play is in town if it's here <laughs> <laughs> i say that and then the next play i get will be a chichis <laughs> tour <laughs> some tour of who knows where but, did, yeah. you do, did you do tours have i done tours yeah. yeah i did a couple i've done i've done a couple tours and they're wild man yeah. you know it's fun but it's also exhausting. You know, I, I toured with uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. That was great. It was fun, but it was, my kid was on the way, you know, and uh, it was just a busy, busy time. And personally, my first, my first kid was on the way. And so I was like constantly worrying, Yeah. you know, and then I, when it was over and he hadn't been born yet, I was like, thank God, you know, like, thank God I'm going to be there for the birth, you know. Mm. Crazy story though. Um, the day my first son was born, I had booked a small part in a Belgian film, the premiere, mm-hmm. and I had to film the day that he was born oh. in Belgium. So I had to be, so he was born at two o'clock in the morning. I got on an eight or nine o'clock train, randomly ran into Fiona, <laughs> who we were just talking about at yeah. the train station yeah. in St. Pancras. She was there. She was like, aren't you supposed to be at the hospital? I was like, I just came from there. I haven't slept in like 20 hours, <laughs> you know, whatever. Uh, and got on a train, got to Belgium, filmed a scene where mm-hmm. I walked down a hallway Yeah. and then got on the train the next morning and came back to London. And if I didn't do that scene, if I didn't, if I backed out of the job, I would have lost the whole job. Yeah. Which was... I think at the time, like 15,000 pounds. And with a new kid, you're like, dude, yeah. I'm not saying no to 15,000 pounds. No. What is this <laughs> dilemma that I'm in right now? And the pressure on my poor wife, like, mm-hmm. babe, have the baby now. <laughs> yeah. You know, I never fucking said that, of course, yeah, but I was, yeah, yeah. you know, in the back of my mind, you're like, man, I fucking hope this baby comes. <laughs> otherwise, this sucks. I'm going to lose 15K. Come on, bud, get out yeah, of there. Yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know but but it is what it is and that's like the that's the beauty of the adventure dude you're just like what the fuck is my life i'll never forget thinking looking at myself in the mirror i didn't set my clock so the car came for me uh to pick to pick me up so the, the first night that i got there mm-hmm. right the way it worked i think i told the story wrong but the way it worked was basically i the baby came i got on the train went got there quarter like afternoon had a fitting and then filmed first thing in the morning and got on the train home. I think that's how we did it. But I, cause I remember staying one night in the hotel and looking at myself in the mirror, mm-hmm. knowing my wife and our new baby were in the hospital in London and I'm in some random holiday in, in mm-hmm. like Belgium. And I'm looking at myself in the mirror going like, what are you doing here? Mm. You know, what's going on? Yeah. And I'd never felt such an overwhelming urge to just like, get on with it but actually you asked like what best film like that's that that was amazing that yeah. film being that that crew that belgian crew they were so cool and the director was amazing his name was eric van louis and we just had an amazing experience i think i was on that film for like six weeks or something like that oh, and wow. they were really cool yeah 
seamless. They were so professional. Hmm. They were so uh, generous. You know, they had a they had a present for for Hudson that they gave me because they hmm. knew that my wife was in labor and nice. I was like having a baby. So when I went back, I had a present from the crew. Beautiful. Super cool. They yeah. were amazing. That, so that was, I mean, that was pretty heavenly. That that shoot was fun. Hmm. But yeah, yeah, wild times. <laughs> So you said you also do a little bit of casting. Yeah. How did it happen and what do you do? So I work for my mother. Oh, yeah. So she does, she's been doing independent films for the better part of four years. And during COVID, I was on furlough from a couple theaters for carpentry work, but money was, was short. Yeah. She was working on a Dutch film at the time. And uh, she needed she needed an extra set of hands to help her with the new protocols with COVID. Everything went online, so now all her meetings with actors all had to be tapes, and she hates that. She likes having in person meetings, so everything went digital. Yeah, and she was kind of stuck, and I was having the opposite problem. My life of being a stage carpenter slash going for auditions and do, you know occasionally doing voiceovers and stuff. My life went quiet. Yeah. Theaters shut off. Everything, they were the first in to lockdown and the last out of lockdown. So I, I was luckily, I was getting like 200 quid a month on furlough from somebody, but that's nothing, you know? And um, I had two kids mm. and uh, have, but yeah. And then was like, this is, this is bad. Luckily, I had a voiceover job that was ongoing and I built a booth in my house and was doing that. Mm -hmm. But in terms of just like being helpful, you know, I could see she was struggling. So I came on as her assistant and started helping her um, and kind of fell in love with it in this way that I'd never really seen the film world. So many illusions were shattered. So many kind of like, you know, preconceived notions disappeared. Yeah. Doing it. Um, like what? Anything that would help. Uh any actors that could listen. Yeah. I mean, like when you, so we put up, we would, we would do everything. So, I mean, she has a film, this, this, we'll do this Dutch film it actually came out this week, mm -hmm. um, called a beautiful imperfection. Um, and I had so much fun with it as her assistant talking to agents, really getting a sense of like the different personalities that are out there, the different levels of, you know, professionalism, like how courteous they are, how polite or whatever, you know, how down to earth they might be, um, all varying degrees, obviously, because they're people. But I think a lot of actors think this is this, this is the an agent at an agency, you know, not saying they're not special, everyone, yeah. you know, everyone, whatever. But we would put, I think as a younger actor, I would put an agent on a pedestal to a certain degree saying mm -hmm. they're like the gateway to work, you know, yeah. and they are in a big way. But I think like, you know, when you start talking to them as a casting assistant or as, as you know, uh, a part of the production, as opposed to like, I need something from you. You know, when you start talking to them and you have creative conversations, you start to really gain a sense of their true nature, of their personality. And that was wonderful. That mm -hmm. was really cool to like, get to know a handful of agents and and say like, all right, so this is like the script, this is the character, this is who we're trying to find. Do you have any suggestions or whatever? Um, and then just going back and forth, let's say we get someone to, to read for a part and put out a breakdown. That was a huge illusion shatterer for me because who's writing the breakdown? Who? I am, the casting assistant. Obviously, sometimes it's different everywhere. Everyone has a different approach, but yeah. you know, at least in this, in this film, I wrote down all the breakdowns. So I read the Based script. Based on the script. Yeah, I read the script, read everything, and then said, you know, I had some consultations with our director, but basically for our for our pool of British actors that we were trying to get into this film, I then wrote the interpretations of the characters. Mm -hmm. The director said, looks good, send it out. So we sent it out. So that's a big responsibility. So when you get a character breakdown, you don't, you don't know who wrote it. Could be an assistant like me, could be the director, could be any. So, you're then looking at it so that when you get a script as an actor reading it, you're like, this is what they said is the breakdown. Mm -hmm. But if I'm reading the script, what do I think of the character? Mm. 
What is my interpretation of this character? So when you get a breakdown, sometimes you don't get a script, but if you're lucky enough to get a script with your breakdown, read the script. None of this bullshit, I don't have time. Read the fucking script. Because that breakdown may not have everything. Yeah. Because they might have to write breakdowns for 20 characters. Short, black, you know, has a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. You're going to go off that? Read the fucking script, you know? So that was like an illusion that kind of shattered for me. And then, you know, (laughs) when you see how many agencies there are just in this city alone as a casting person, and you put out a breakdown for 20 20 characters and you put it out on spotlight and then you see all the agencies that submit actors, you're like, damn, there's a lot of us. Yeah. There's a lot of actors. It's true. You know? And in some ways that can be like imprisoning and you're like, damn, damn, this is depressing. Or you're like, well, (laughs) this gives me actually a sense of relief, of freedom. Yeah. Because so much of it is impersonal. It's not a a personal offense if you don't get the part. Of course. You might not get the part because the director doesn't like your eyebrows. Yeah. And they they may not even say that. Mm. They just say, no, I don't like him. Yeah. And so there's two steps. So that you're, you're, it's like the Tinder thing, you know, they just see your headshot. They maybe look at your CV, you know, and you then go, all right, no, yes. And that's awful. But if a director is giving you a specific thing of what you need to find, a specific yeah. idea, a vision, your job as the casting person is to adhere to that kind of vision. And then the wonderful thing is, is that if you have an amazing casting director, they can then say, I know this person isn't what you were looking for, but this person is special. Yeah. This person has what it takes to bring that character to life. Mm-hmm. Let me tape them for you. Let me show you. And you can see what I mean. Yeah. And then they'll fight for you. They'll go to back to you. So that's, I mean, that's part of, you know, I think it's part of the, the process for some casting directors who, who I think have a relationship with the actor, you know? And so it, it really matters. I think if you, if you have casting directors, you know, they're, you know, like we talk about agents being on pedestals, mm-hmm. Casting directors are, they're, they're people too. Mm-hmm. You know, we can't like, you can't just be like, oh, I don't want to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing or whatever. You just got to be yourself. Yeah. You know, you got to be honest, be polite, be, be yourself as best you can with them. If you can be honest, polite and be yourself at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I think it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, so th- the, I think the main thing that I learned from starting to do the, the casting stuff uh, you know, those are very detailed things, but I think the main thing I learned was this idea of these, uh, preconceived notions like illusions, this idea that like, I'm a lonely, lowly actor. I'm just an actor. No one's interested in what I might have to say or what my thoughts might be about such mm-hmm. and such. I let through, through doing the casting, I let all that go. Mm-hmm. That, that disappeared. And suddenly I became unafraid to talk to the head producer, to say what I thought to the director, to say what I thought to whoever, the writer, that these conversations, obviously not rudely, but like if I, if they said something and I disagreed, I would voice my opinion. Mm. Whereas often I think in a rehearsal scenario or something as an actor, if they, if someone of authority, so to speak, says something that you disagree with, Oftentimes, personally, I'd be like, all right, Mm. that's the way it is, you know? Yeah. And they don't want that. They're collaborators. They want to know what you think. They want to know if you disagree. Mm. They want to be challenged. Obviously not everyone, but they want to be challenged (laughs) all the time (laughs) because it's a collaboration, you know, because they want to know like, oh shit, maybe there is another way of looking at this. Maybe that character does have this, that, the other thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. So in that in that sense it it released that like kind of fear of authority that fear of like speaking my opinion Mm. and through talking with other industry professionals whether they're uh agents or managers or the director or the producer or the writer of these projects that we're trying to work on 
it filled me with a sense of confidence of that actually, you know what, I, I kind of know a thing or two because that's wrong. <laughs> what you just said, you know what I mean? Like, you're like, that's absolutely not true. Or that's, that's actually, I agree with that. You know, so I, it suddenly helped me grow up a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, and this was around the time that I was talking about, I'm, I'm done. I think yeah. I'm done, you know? And it was kind of this revelation and my wife, she's like my, she is my rock. She's, but she's like the voice of reason, you know, mm -hmm. I'm over here, the red devil and she's over here, the angel. And she kind of said, you know, to paraphrase, she was like, doing this, doing casting, you're ticking all these boxes in certain ways, right? But it may free you up when it comes to your acting and help you and help you have a new approach or a new point of view. Yeah. And she was absolutely 100% right. Mm -hmm. that, that level of confidence that you're asking about or whatever, it came from that. And I think helping with the casting actually brought me out of that funk. Mm -hmm. And I stopped being a, a carpenter. Mm -hmm. I haven't done it since. And as much of a nightmare it can be to work with your mother, <laughs> It's the best sense of job security I ever had. I've never wanted to fight for anything harder Yeah. to help her, you know? And it's an honor to work with her. She's, she should write a book. She's amazing. You should be doing this interview with her. You should actually, if you wanted to do one with her, I can try and set it up. But she honestly, like, she's so unique in her way. And I've learned so much from being with her and it's given me so much confidence in this professional way, obviously. like. You know, as you were talking at the beginning about, you know, what's it like to have a mother in the industry? But, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's like, you know, it's this, this wonderful balance. Nice. You know? Nice. I love it. So what, what is in, in, in the pipeline for you? Right now, I've got this thing I'm producing, which is a whirlwind, which as soon as we're done talking, I'm going back into the world of. Uh, which is a short film mm -hmm. with one of my co-stars from Halo. Mm -hmm. that she's written and, and is going to direct. Um, nice. And it's uh, it's basically a proof of concept for a TV show she wants to do. So it's a dark comedy. So we filmed that this weekend. Um, I have two casting projects on the horizon, which I can't talk about. Okay. Uh, but uh, those are pretty exciting. Hopefully going to start filming in the new year, in the spring. Um, and between now and then, I'm hoping to pick up uh, the odd voiceover job mm -hmm. or or something like that. Uh, and um, and I'm supposed to be doing another short that I'm producing with a wonderful director named Ian McDonald mm -hmm. uh, in right before Christmas. All right, man. Look, let's do Blitz Round. Okay, Blitz Round. Blitz Round. Uh, quick questions, quick answers. No points. No right or wrong. Okay. Th there might be some wrong answers, but... I'll, I'll let you slide. <laughs> okay. Texting or talking? Talking. Cats or dogs? Neither. No, really? Neither. No animals? No. All right. Your one guilty pleasure? Beer. Oh, I'm not even guilty anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Beer. Uh, Beer and popcorn, dude. Uh, uh, what makes you laugh? My, my kids make me laugh. All there right. you go. What makes you angry? You know the noise that uh, your seatbelt thing in your car makes when you don't put it on? Oh, yeah. And it beeps and it beeps and it beeps and it beeps and it beeps. And you're like, <laughs> I'm on a country road. They, <laughs> I'm putting it on. You know? <laughs> that, that's so annoying. Right. I wish there was a way you could set it. Like, you know how you could get series voice, like different mm -hmm. voices. I wish there was a way you could set it to be a voice mm -hmm. and it could be like a sarcastic voice. <laughs> And I could just be like, what? You don't care about your life? <laughs> your passenger doesn't care about their life. They're not wearing their seatbelt. That'd be hilarious yeah. if it was just that, just doing that, instead of the beeping. Like, well, you know it, what, as a voice actor, maybe you should record a couple of demos and send it to, you know. To true, true. <laughs> All right, yeah. next. Uh, do you have any nicknames? Nate. Is there a dish that you cook best? I make a nice chicken, like a chicken roast dinner uh your favorite character in any fictional story like book film game vincent vega in pulp fiction mm. john travolta i love that character i don't know why that was my first thought 
But yeah, actually another one would be Brad Pitt's character. I can't remember his name in uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about? What's the character's name? I don't remember. Damn, I wish I, I could remember, remember that too. The stunt guy. <laughs> yeah, the stunt guy. Star Wars or The Lord of the Rings? Star Wars. That was hard. Alien or Aliens? Alien. Do you have any unknown or unexpected talent? I'm a mean cyclist. Really? Like on these streets, dude, I'm like another person. Not like angry or anything yeah. like that. Like it's just something different. I don't know. Like, yeah, it's just, it's, it's like adventure, danger, sanity, mm. safety, all rolled into one. <laughs> it's like this beast that comes out, you know, mm. I'm another person on a bicycle in this city. It's weird. Mm. Interesting. Like taking risks, knowing when not to take them, like, and it's at such speed, you know, like you, you have to make these calculations so fast, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I'm not really good on, on the bike. I mean, like I can ride it. Yeah. I never, I never even, never learned how to ride without hands. I can't. I have to help hold this with one. Oh, well, you go to the park. Go to Battersea Park. They have bikes you can rent there. There's some. There's like it's so open. Uh, like I, I think it's too late when you're 41 to like to try to learn how to ride a bike without hands. Like it's just like I, I don't care anymore. <laughs> I don't need that skill in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. All right. Uh, how often do you cry? Not not that often, but I do. I do. Mm -hmm. um, a few times a year, unless it's like for a part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How can people reach you if they want to work with you? We could do Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You will find Instagram in the, in the description to the episode. And finally, one cool thing, something you, you really enjoy that you think our listeners or viewers should try to. For me, I found that doing competitive sports was something I really missed in my life. Mm. Um, and I, I was also, like I said, my brothers played baseball. I was pretty good at baseball. And when, when I moved here, um, they were like, join team GB for mm -hmm. baseball. Right. And I was like, we mean join team GB. And they were like, no, just join dude. They played already for the team. Uh, and they would have a tournament like every, every couple of years. And I was like, what do you mean? Just join. And they're like, dude, here's the coach's number. Call him. He'll take you for a tryout. Join. So I was like, fuck it, whatever. I, I found a men's league and started playing baseball here. Joined the tryout was literally like, the dude hit me a few balls, watched me throw, and was like, you're on the team. Because mm -hmm. they're terrible. I love them, they're such nice dudes, but they're awful. So with like a basic skill set of baseball like and a British passport, I made the team. So mm -hmm. I don't think of it as like a massive accomplishment because you know, the baseball the competition is so, so high in the States. And these guys were good here. Like they're much better than your average person, but compared to like the all-star teams in the States and the pros in the States, you know, anyway, nice dudes, good at baseball, but I made the team. We're playing in a game and by some crazy fluke accident, I broke my arm throwing the ball. Crazy, just broke my arm. And for me, that was the end of competitive sports. Mm -hmm. I stopped doing anything. I was, I lost an acting job. I stopped doing competitive sports and was like, I'm not doing that again. And then recently I found someone was talking to me and they were like, hey, do you want to do this triathlon? Mm -hmm. And I was like, sure, why not? So there was a comp in competitive sport. So I did one triathlon and then they were like, uh, what are you going to do another one? And I was like, I don't know. I then signed up for another one and I did it and I loved it. Mm -hmm. That was great. Now I'm not going to go full bore triathlon. I'm not going to tell people to go be triathletes or whatever, but I found that doing competitive sports was a great way for me to keep that kind of that youthful, like athletic quality that I like cherish. Mm -hmm. And then recently I found this thing called high rocks, which is like this crazy combination of stamina, cardio and weightlifting. And they do this like huge competition and they're really hard to get into. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine and I got into one and we're doing one in November. So I'm starting training for that, which nice. would be insane. But it mm -hmm. keeps you healthy, keeps you focused on something. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, that competitive nature. Yeah. Nice. 
All right, cool, man. Like, it was very nice to talk to you. Dude, Finally. me too. It's been so, so long. Yeah. Uh, we need to do it more often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we do. We should go for a beer. Yes. Go have a beer, dude. Thank you very much. I will I will let you go and do your stuff. Thank you, dude. And, no, it's, uh, been, it's been absolutely a pleasure. Thank, so you, thank you. Thanks. If you enjoyed it, like, subscribe, and let us know again. Let us know about Halo or any other projects that you've been, that you've seen Nathan in. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.